Hello, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. My name is Adam Downing with Virginia Cooperative Extension. Today, we're gonna to take a look at the intersection of forestry and agriculture. First of all, let's take a look at Virginia. All that dark green you see, about two thirds of the state is covered in forest land. But we've got some areas where there's a lot of agriculture. In fact, the Shenandoah Valley is a epicenter of agriculture for Virginia. And it is also one of the top poultry producing regions in the country. And we will be taking a look at a farm in northern Rockingham County called Turley Creek, which is just outside of Broadway. On this farm, they raise chickens for meat. This is the chicken house. And beside that, we have planted trees, civil pasture for the chickens. And then we'll go down the road to McCormick Farm in southern Augusta County, where we have a research site set up to examine and study the difference in performance of meat birds in a civil pasture, such as this triangular area that we have established, and some plots outside of that in the wide open field. Let's get to the woods. Hi, I'm Dr. Leonie Jacobs. I'm with Virginia Tech, and today we're planting trees for a civil pasture project at a large commercial scale poultry farm. Uh, we're planting different types of fruit trees, including surface berry and mulberry and hazelnut trees together with black locust in the pasture with the birds. And for this project, we'll compare uh, components related to animal welfare, productivity and the environment and how this silver pasture can uh, benefit compared to regular pasture access. So we're planting the pasture that's right beside the poultry house and we're making sure that the birds have access to the range of trees and switchgrasses too. Uh, we're alternating some of these fruit trees with black locusts, so there, there's a variety of species across the field. And hopefully this will entice birds to come out and range further from the house rather than just stay indoors or stay near to the house. So we're at an organic uh, farm that allows birds to range freely outdoors. So they have access to the outdoors weather permitting for uh, about half of their lives. And they can go outdoors and range on the grass and maybe eat some bugs and forage around besides just being indoors, which would be uh, the conventional broiler chicken production system. Today we have Vidur Panero here and he is the grad student on the project, PhD student, and he is uh, helping making sure that this project will run successfully. Originally I'm from Nepal and I came here for my master's and did my master's from uh, Tuskegee University, Alabama and I switched my PhD to Virginia Tech uh, looking into the broiler welfare and working in the silver pasture based poultry production system and looking into more of uh, how this system will impact on animal welfare, economics and environmental impacts. So we're planting these trees and grasses and working in the plot and yes, I'm really excited about this project. My name is Clay Miller and this is a family operation with my mom and dad and myself of Turley Creek Farm. We're here located in Broadway, Virginia. Uh, this house right here is a, is a roughly a 25,000 square foot building. Uh, we. Uh, we placed 23,500 birds in here. Conventional grower for chickens for many, many years. And uh, when I first started with the organic birds, you know, I was that guy on the fence that said, oh, there's no way, they don't taste any different. Well, I'm here to tell you, there is a difference in the quality of meat and the tasteability of these organic birds. So I'm Dr. John Fike. I'm in the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences at Virginia Tech. And I have, um, been working with Dr. Leone Jacobs in animal science uh, at Virginia Tech to implement some civil pasture strategies for poultry. And today we're on a producer site on an organic uh, poultry uh, farm. And we are putting in some uh, different types of understory and overstory types of trees for woody vegetation. That woody vegetation uh, can provide nitrogen from the black locust and a lot of soft mast from mulberry and hard mast from hazelnut. Uh, we also have service berry, which would be another soft mast uh, type of small tree, uh, maybe you know dominant shrub sort of uh, morphology. Then we're uh, expecting those trees to grow a little slower on this site, and so we are also adding some lowland ecotype switchgrass 
the lowland ecotypes are, are larger, more robust plants, and they get up and leave some structure underneath for, or space for uh, birds to, to move. Um, Dr. Jacobs will tell you that chickens are essentially jungle fowl, and so we are trying to create little jungle habitats, as it were, uh, for these animals that would support insect life that they might eat on, that would um, put carbon back into the soil, uh, that would create better habitat for the birds uh, for their health and welfare. So I have a couple of clumps of switchgrass here. These were dug up from a native stand. We, we would more typically plant a stand of switchgrass from seed. We decided for a couple of reasons. One, we wanted bigger plants to get going quickly and two, to not have to deal with some of these other you know, establishment issues. Uh, we thought that that would be a better approach to establishing the switchgrass here. Um, and hopefully these plants, which this variety might be, you know, 8, 10, 12 feet tall in really good situations, we hope that it will get several feet tall, you know, maybe four, six feet tall, something like in year one, and start to create some of the structure or habitat for the birds, you know, right off the get-go instead of taking time to come up from seed and, and dealing with the challenges of that. The other aspect of planting this way is that we're able to do that at the same time we're planting trees, whereas normally with switchgrass we would uh, have to do a lot of ground prep um, to, to prepare the seed bed and we would probably be planting in say uh, May or June, so it would be out of synchrony with our tree planting. So this works really well for our purposes. It's not something we would recommend for the grand scale. Uh, but in this context, it should work well. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about uh, tree protection now. Um, in many cases, trees, seedlings need protected, especially from deer. Uh, in this case, we're protecting the trees from the, uh, some of the trees from chickens. Um, although we don't expect the chickens would damage the trees, uh, in this particular situation, uh, it's an organic farm and these uh, locust trees were grown by the state nursery which does use a minimal amount of insecticide and fungicide. So we're installing two different uh, tree protection systems here. One is called Tubex, it's the brand. The, um, they're always this color, Tubex is. There's two different ends, one is straight and one is flanged. The flanged end goes up so that as the tree grows out it doesn't cut it as bad. And simply to install it, you slide it over the tree you make sure that the tree does not go inside of these loops, these uh, zip ties. You look down in and roughly center it, and you twist this tube a little bit to get it down in the ground in case there are voles, and then this also will protect the roots from voles. Okay, so the, this is a white oak stake, and it's white oak so that it lasts longer. And um, you put it in the bottom loop there, a short, short sledge works well to uh, get it started. And then I usually tip that away and hold this uh, vertical and go ahead and drive it in as deep as you can to get it good and sturdy, but not past this top zip tie. And then you just make sure that things look good, tighten up the zip tie, top and bottom, and that's it. The tree is protected. These do need to be uh, checked on about uh, once a year, especially after the frost heave. These can be moved out a little bit uh, out of the ground, get a little wonky. Okay, the last step with this is to put on a bird net. Uh, the problem, the challenge sometimes we have with these is that birds will sit on top and fall down in and actually die. So this bird net keeps that from happening. Now that's all it does, just slips over that. And now we'll move over to the plant rest system. The biggest difference with Plantra is a flexible stake, okay, whereas we had a wooden stake before, this will flex, which can be good because sometimes the wooden stakes will just break. If, say, a, a deer or a larger animal, a bear, pushes up against it, it'll just break. So the flexible system and these tubes come packed flat, so you open them up a little bit. The tube also, the stake also goes inside the tube. Stake in first, it comes with a little driver. And the idea is to get it down to this level. There's a little marker on the stake. So get it that deep if you can. And there are holes that you open up on this tube 
that um, little twist ties go in. The stake on this one goes inside the tube. The tree goes, of course, inside the tube. And does someone have the twist ties? Twist ties. We'll get the twist ties, and uh, this net just looks a little bit different, but again goes on top to keep the bird from falling down in. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Bracewood. And so these slide in here. Just bend them a little bit. Yeah. Nice heavy duty twist ties. That um, one um, producer we know or, and, and, and practitioner uses this system, and then with the, um, these twist ties, he puts some barbed wire kind of coils around it. And he does that in, in a situation where there's livestock, cattle, namely, to keep these from uh, getting pushed over. My name's Gabe Penn. I'm the superintendent here at the Virginia Tech Shenandoah Valley Ag Research and Extension Center, also known as the McCormick Farm. And I'm standing in a civil pasture that was developed for cattle and we're able to utilize it for a different animal this year that I'm excited about and hopefully learn some new things with our animal welfare and forage colleagues here at the farm. All right, so today we planted our civil pasture here at the Shenandoah Valley ARAC. Uh, this is a SARE funded project where we're looking at a silver pasture system for broiler chickens and we'll compare it to broiler chickens that are kept uh, on regular grass pasture. So we plant trees here even though there are already trees here because uh, chickens like overhead cover from natural vegetation so they prefer to have a forested area to forage in and root around and walk around. So that's why we needed to plant some new trees here to make sure that they have, when the summer starts, have enough uh, coverage to feel safe and secure. We have the help of John Fike, Dr. John Fike here today too. Uh, he's from the School of Plant and Environmental Science and he's uh, here to support us from the plant side, so the silver pasture side, and making sure that everything goes well. Yes, I am kind of the gray-haired old man of silver pasture, at least at Virginia Tech, and I've been working with it for about 20 years, and uh, have the fortune of having some really good colleagues and students uh, that are now colleagues to work with. Um, most of our work has been focused on ruminant systems, thinking about adding trees back into pastures for uh, greater welfare for livestock or providing uh, browse for livestock. Um, and so, so to work on the poultry silver pasture is a little bit of a um, departure from what I'm, what I'm used to. Uh, but as Dr. Jacob said, these are uh, jungle birds. And so having trees or shrubs uh, that provide some protective cover is um, one way that we might improve their uh, well-being and reduce their stress. Uh, they might uh, explore more of a range because they are less stressed. And the opportunity to work with these kind of integrated systems uh, and the added diversity that comes with that may mean that there's more um, insect diversity. Uh, whether that's in their diet or not really doesn't matter. And from my perspective, uh, just thinking about things like bird decline, uh, adding diversity back into the system has the potential to increase habitat for other creatures that may benefit the system in a, in a greater fashion. Um, that's not really what we're here for. We're really here to see, do we benefit the birds? I mean, this is really a production study, but we have other uh, features or functions that come out of these kind of integrated systems that we would uh, hope to have an opportunity to try to measure.